Hello and welcome to Tomorrow. My name is Jamie Higginbotham and we are joined by a group of epic people today. We've got a Space Mike, a Zach, and a Jared sitting here. And uh, it's going to be a really fun show. It, this week was a, uh, this was a hard week. This wasn't a great... <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Space Mike, what happened? Probably the biggest thing this week that everyone was looking forward to was, of course, the eighth flight of Starship. And unfortunately, things didn't go according to plan. And the Starship blew up over the, the Bahamas once again. <sighs> but at least we got the uh, the booster back and they had a very successful catch of the booster. So that was great to see. But... Man, it's kind of hard to talk about, man. I'm still I'm still super depressed about this. I think I was just as surprised as everybody else about this specific failure. Having a failure in the same flight regime as a failure you had beforehand, which you said you licked that failure. Like you like we are not expecting this to occur again. And then having it something occur again in the exact same area. That's really, really difficult. I think it kind of says a bit about the testing process of things like this, which is that it is very, very difficult to test upper stages, which that's what Starship is. It's an upper stage. And testing upper stages is extremely difficult because those conditions that you have to replicate for an upper stage are near impossible to do on the ground. So they did that very, they did that, what was it, a 60 second static fire with Starship in order to figure out the issue that they were having with it. You sort of end up wondering about that simply because you're not actually in that flight environment that it's in. You're on the ground and there's a lot of different things that happen on the ground. There's a lot of different things with tanking, a lot of different things with the forces, on the structure of the vehicle, the lack of acceleration on the vehicle and other things like that. So it's it's a lot to cover. And I'm looking forward to when we hear more details uh, from this. I know we have the initial reports, but I'm, I'm just looking forward to the official details as to what happens once we're uh, allowed to figure that out. So yeah, I, disappointing and very un-SpaceX-like. Uh, to have two failures in a row in the same part of flight. I'd like to pay attention to this particular part of the launch right here, because this is my theory as to what might have gone wrong. We have the uh, the, the maneuver to uh, do the boost back burn for the booster, and there's just a brief moment there where as it's firing its engines to, to boost away, it seemed like there was a little bit of plume that actually hit the starship. You can see one of the RCS thrusters kind of fighting uh, against it during that, that pitch over right there. So I don't know because I don't have access to any of the data, but I wonder if that had anything to do with it because of what we see a little bit later on in the flight. There's, there's some other interesting things like the engine outs on Super Heavy there, you know, could could there have been some sort of inter plume interaction that was unaccounted for earlier and and that made those engines upset to shut them down, other things like that. It's just, uh, it, it's just, it's not a good feeling to, to fail at the exact same moment after you do a huge amount of work in order to prevent yourself from, from having that mistake there. Zach, what did you think about this? I, I think one thing I find, it's it's kind of a funny place to be is we're watching Super Heavy be caught, and that's just normal now. They've only done it three times, but the last two times, I, I, specifically in Flight 7, they caught the booster, and then the thing with the ship happened. And I love that one of the hosts was literally like, but don't forget, we did catch the booster. And it was like, yeah, we had all forgot that they just did this incredible catch of a 20-story building, and we're all sad and disappointed about the ship, which is fair, we should be. And real and, quick, here's the moment right here where the engines went yeah. out, and you can see a little bit of a little bit of <laughs> things that are not supposed to be there on the right hand side before it starts uh, tumbling around. Yeah. Well, and then you, I like the graphic. The graphic at the bottom is great. That it's it's trying, it's trying to keep up. We all knew the second we saw not even like a one degree turn, we're like, uh oh. I am really glad, though, that we were able to continue getting this footage, even if just for a couple more seconds, so that we could actually see this tumble. I mean, it's not the result that we want. It's certainly unfortunate, but, you know, I still am blown away by the amount of beautiful footage. And obviously, we were getting cutting, you know, cutouts and everything like that. But I think that's just another testament to Starlink. 
I mean, think about this thing spinning uncontrolled and it's still maintaining a signal strong enough to satellites to send that type of video signal down. Um, it's insane. Yeah. And what's really great about that, those videos are definitely lasting a lot longer than the previous flights video did. So to me, that tells me they've got better bandwidth and that they're getting actual telemetry from the vehicle. I would imagine for flight eight, for this one, they have more data post anomaly than they do from flight seven i would imagine someone somewhere at starbase has got a hard drive full of information um and a group of people is just combing over it trying to figure out every little detail every point in flight so yeah there's just there's it's, this is complicated it's it it, it really is rocket science <laughs> so it's like there's just no way to get around how complicated it is and i I do want to mention that upper stages are a difficult thing to do correctly. Well, speaking of things that are hard and uh, things that are difficult with rocket science, we had another major failure this week. Yeah, Intuitive Machines uh, uh, <laughs> launched their, their second deja vu for IM2 because Intuitive Machines uh, <laughs> did land on the moon but tipped over once again. And welcome back, Jamie. Yeah, thank you. So made it to the moon. Made it to the moon, but tipped over once again, and uh, they were able yeah. to land, and they had great communication the entire way. I was worried that they were going to have some bad communication because they've had so many other problems with the communications lately, but they were able to have full contact during this thing and even put in a couple of commands because apparently they had their own issue with a hazard avoidance and trying to move out of the way because what we were seeing from the telemetry was that it was hovering for a little while or that its, it's uh, velocity was staying the same, but its altitude was just ever so slightly hovering between like 15 and, tw and uh, 20 meters, I believe, because the, the engine didn't turn off. The engine stayed on uh, during this whole landing process when they're like, it looks like that we're on the moon, but the engine is still on. So they had to manually turn it off. Once they finally manually turned off the engine, then it tipped over and we get this image that we are seeing from the surface. No video that we were able to get from it. And unfortunately, after only a couple of hours, I believe it was like 13, 12 or 14 hours, something like that, they lost power completely because none of the solar panels were getting hit by the sun, so they weren't able to recharge their batteries or deploy hardly any of their experiments. Some uh, some comments from the chat room. John says, the intuitive machines lander is, is you could be nicer, John, is idiotic. A higher than wow. larger design is inherently unstable. But basically, the you know going towards like a, a tall, skinny thing is going to have a hard time you, you know, being stable on an unstable landing area. And, you know, we joked last week or a week before about Armstronging it because, like, there's just boulders and a whole bunch of stuff out there. But, like, the, the, why, why is the vehicle so tall? Like, why not flatten it out a lot more? Is there a technical reason? NASA is trying on purpose to test out a whole bunch of different designs to see mm -hmm. what works. However, I don't know if, if a company unless they didn't know, would would take on the role of, we're going to build the one that fails on purpose. <laughs> you know? So I, I, have, I have a hard time believing that that's where they were trying to go with this. I have a fleeting suspicion that it is the fact that it, the intuitive machines, the Nova C class lander that they're using here, is actually methalox. So, right? So it's huh. liquid oxygen, liquid methane. Uh, that they're using for that, what, right? Isn't what, that wild? Like I, like I didn't. Even why would you do like, methalox on the moon? Like methalox yeah. on Mars makes total sense. Hydrolox on the moon makes total sense. Hydrolox on Mars makes a lot less sense, and hyd methalox on the moon makes a lot less sense. So, why methalox? Well, all the cool kids are doing methalox <laughs> nowadays. Yeah, just from an engineering standpoint, make that make sense. Like, there's got to be, I'm sure there's an engineering reason behind it. But, you know, again, methane on Mars, hydrogen on the moon. People say hydrogen for the moon because you can create more with the lunar ice there. But even right. then, yeah. I still hesitate because I'm like, mm, boil off. I'd rather have a hypergolic that I can store and be able to use every yeah. last drop Thank of you. it. Uh, it all depends on what you want to do, right? If you're just going down to the moon and you're going to stay there, totally, right? Just bring hypergalls, be done with it, right? 
But if you want to develop a vehicle that can go down, refuel, and then come back up, and then you can use a reusable vehicle, hypergalls are not going to be, you're not making hypergalls on the moon, right? So that's where, if we wanted to do some testing on the moon, okay, I can understand where we want to test with like a Hydrolox engine if you wanted to figure out like, can we make this work, right? You got to do it in stages, right? You're not going to bring your Hydrolox engine to the moon and then also refuel it on the same go. You're going to be like, okay, does it even work first, right? And then it's like, now how do I figure out how to refuel this thing? Um, but Methalox, <laughs> like I, it doesn't fit in any of the boxes, right? Like it, I can't, it, it's not like, okay, this is reusable. It's not like, oh, hey, this is stable. It's like, like you know, just you use hypergalls. Man of Sand says, intuitive machines website says, Methalox offers super mass to propellant ratio. Just, just, so does Hydrolox. <laughs> like even better with Hydrolox, right? I feel like there's a bigger plan there. If you're using a Methalox engine, there has to be a bigger reason why you chose Methalox. Not the core issue, right? Like it fell over. That's the core issue. That's the um, core twice. <laughs> and how can I argue with that right yep. there, right? Like yep. man, too many landers is a nice problem to have. It, it, what a great time to be alive right now. Like all of these different super heavy lift launchers, all of these missions going back to the moon, all of this testing and a uh, YOLO, let's see what happens, right? Like let's make this thing go, right? It's the era of paper rockets and paper exploration is over, right? We've gotten past that. We realized that you don't, if you just do it on paper, you don't ever go anywhere, right? And so now it's, hey, Let's try it and find out. And our appetite for failure is certainly not huge, but it's it's much larger than it was before. Yeah, we're finally into what I like to call hardware-rich exploration era, where we're finally like actually doing things as opposed to talking about them. <laughs> <laughs>